but anyway, as uh, Paul said, uh, my name's Andrew. I come um, from uh, the northwest originally. And bluestone archaeology is, is something that I kind of do as a sideline, really. Um, my day job is with Cotswold archaeology. Um, so this is very much uh, uh, focused in on doing good works, community projects, um, days trips, day walks, school um, trips, that kind of thing. Just positive, beneficial work uh, as a side to, to kind of my day job, really. Not that that's not beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> very conscious that some colleagues in the audience there. <laughs> Um, so, okay, where is Hapton? Because I'm probably aware that no one has ever heard of it. Um, it's a tiny little village in between Burnley and Accrington, uh, up in Lancashire. So there it is. Uh, and this is really the tale of two projects. Uh, the first one being way back in 2012, um, where the local community group, um, very, very active community group, doing various, various things, um, but wanted to do a heritage study of their, community, uh, their local landscape their community, and in particular, uh, a site here, um, which was reputed to be a castle. Um, big earthworks in a field called Castle Field. Everyone knew it was the castle, and it was scheduled as castle. Uh, I may have disappointed them, but we'll come on to that in a bit. <laughs> uh, then the second project, which is more recent, uh, focused in on Hapton Park, which is basically roughly in that green uh, circle, and a hunting lodge, which is more or less there, uh, known as Hapton Tower. Okay, so where did we start? Um, we were invited in um, to give them some heritage advice. Um, they'd already talked to the HLF, Historic England, uh, various local authority um, people as well. Um, and they wanted to do a real detailed survey of this castle. Um, so we were brought in. Uh, I very rapidly was suspicious <laughs> that it wasn't a castle uh, and was becoming by the day, very nervous that I was going to get chased out of the village by telling them that this was not actually a particularly interesting site. It was interesting, just for a completely different reason. Um, so we went out, we did uh, two weeks of survey work, we had volunteers crawling over the earthworks with tapes, and we did some GPS survey, um, and it was absolutely great fun. Um, the problem was this, I mean, I don't know whether anyone disagrees with me, it was not very much a castle. Um, there was something else going on here. It was too small, it was in the wrong geographical location, it was kind of at the bottom of a hill in a real weird dip. Um, there was some big, fresh cuts into it, um, and my interpretation ended up being that it was actually more likely to be industrial remains. Um, basically, that big escarpment is not a moat, um, it's more likely to be a kind of quarry scar with a little crane base. The crane had a mortared stone in there and big metal bits sticking out of it. Um, it was not medieval <laughs> in any way. Um, and I just did not enjoy feeding this back to the, the community group. But they, you know, they had their hearts out on a castle. Um, so what we did is we kind of sent them off uh, to do some more research. Um, we did a, a massive desk-based assessment of the, the whole landscape, essentially. So they spent months and months rooting around, picking up documents, feeding back pieces of information that we collated together. So we, we kind of took their enthusiasm and, and directed it into something where they could get some real tangible results out of and some real kind of something that they could they take as a legacy. Uh, but when I walked away from it, I was conscious that I had disappointed the group, who's very much a volunteer led survey. Um, you know, they wanted to go and look at their castle, take ownership of it. They wanted to say, you know, We've got a, a big castle in our back garden. They, as part of the project, they even diverted some funds to create a crest for, the, for Hapton Village, which had a castle on it. <laughs> so they got that properly ratified by, uh, as, a, as heraldry for Hapton. Um, so what we had to do was kind of try and curb their enthusiasm a bit in that sense, but really let them investigate the landscape and try and take that prejudgment of what might be there away. Um, but as I say, in the back of my mind, they were always thinking that they had this in their village, when actually it was a bit more like this. Um, <laughs> so, tricky, but um, I, we wanted them to, to kind of take a legacy and kick on and, and really, you know, uh, do the next project. So we were very, very grateful indeed when they then came back to us um, and said, look, we want to, to try and answer this question. Um, and the question that had come up during the course of their desk based research as part of the first project was searching for a small hamlet that was within Hapton Parish called Birtwistle, um, that no one really knew where it was. 
Uh, if you go back and kind of do an old English analysis of the name, it kind of could mean between two streams, but there's a number of interpretations. We're all aware of how the dodgy place name evidence can be at times. Um, but within Hapton Park, um, which is just down here, this is Hapton Park, you'll see there's a forking of streams there. Um, so they wanted to go and look into the park and see if they could relocate this lost village. So they came back to us and we set up the project as a CIC. We went to the HLF, we got the funding, uh, we wrote the project design. Now that doesn't mean the volunteers were shut out. <laughs> Everything was done with consultation with them. We sat down, we said, what do you want to get out of this? What do you want to do? You know, do you just want to go and do some survey or do you want to, to do other elements? And of course, the thing that they all said uniformly was we want to dig some holes. Um, that hadn't been possible with the castle because it had been scheduled. And because the funding didn't allow for it, there was no way to kind of then go for consent and dig across the castle and try and find out if it actually was a castle or a quarry. So with this new project, um, we designed it in a tiered approach. We let them do some more research. We then did a series of walkover surveys. We then did some detailed surveys. And crucially, they got to follow through the archaeological process and get hands-on with each element, which not only meant that um, they could see how it's done, uh, but people who perhaps couldn't get up onto the site could engage with the desk-based part. Um, people who couldn't kind of dig could get on board with the finds and so on and so forth. So we did some test pits as well. And that is everyone scratching their head over some stones. I genuinely don't know what was in that. <laughs> I should say as well, this is on a wind farm that's maintained by United Utilities. Um, so it, there are some logistical issues. But um, rather than kind of just everyone wandering out onto the village green and surveying the castle, we kind of had proper amenities. I mean, you might not consider that to be proper. But <laughs> there was somewhere, this is on an open Lancashire Pennine hillside, so that was pretty essential <laughs> to have somewhere to shelter and somewhere to have a brew. We did lunchtime talks. Everyone got hands on with doing every single different part of the recording aspect. Um, we did some wider walk and talks in the landscape. Um, there's some interesting earthworks in, in the landscape around the site. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was great to kind of be able to take people up and do that whole bounce ideas around and get them to kind of bring out a bit of confidence in potential interpretations, just telling them nothing stupid, nothing silly, tell us. And you know we'll, we'll we'll feed back and have that discussion, um, because obviously we we were set up as a as a kind of uh, professional union. You know, we could let them get hands on with toys and not not to everyone's interest or taste. But those who wanted to learn about how to use GPS or, or total stations could have a play with those. We did some geophysics as well. Although I have to say the farmer had spread quite a lot of interesting things. So <laughs> geophysics. I haven't got a wonderful geophysics plot because it's just white noise. <laughs> Um, yeah, and actually, uh, uh, whereas the castle site produced an earthwork plan and me rather disappointingly saying I don't think it's a castle, we had physical finds that they could get on, on, you know, hands on with and, and look at and we did workshops and uh, it was just, it was a lot more of a, a linear process that allowed them to see how we think and also let them, everyone get engaged with each part of the process. So was it better? In my opinion, it was. but. That was mainly because the archaeology was better and allowed us to get in there. What really matters is what they thought. <laughs> so I'll quickly whiz through some of the results that we got and then I'll get to the important bit, which is their feedback. And this is my um, initial earthwork survey of what we thought might be bird whistle. I mean, we still do. Um, so we have some possible platforms. And what I think is a, a mill building on the um, right hand side and the isolated earthworks and a series of platforms on the left-hand side. Now, interestingly, um, they're all over-plowed, um, but they're cut through by this linear earthwork. And when we traced that all the way around, that turned out to be the park boundary. So the linear that cuts across the platforms, kind of um, southwest and northeast, is the uh, 1500 Hapton Park boundary, and it cuts across these platforms. But everything is over-plowed, so it's a really nice earthwork stratigraphy. We've got a really good dating profile, and we're currently looking at doing some test pits there. And this is, like I said, Park Boundary, and I walked this with a bunch of volunteers, which was enjoyable but exhausting. <laughs> uh, getting some people who were perhaps slightly more advanced in years onto Hamilton Hill 
um, at the bottom there was, uh, yeah, it, it, it took careful planning, <laughs> but it was really good fun. And the park um, boundary really nicely overlays with a 1600s plan of the park when it was being broken up. So we know that that's what we've got. And interestingly, we've got multi-phases. So an earlier park boundary that's then extended because um, it was kind of piecemeal expanded uh, and some interesting land grabbing going on by the townies who, uh, who owned it. Uh, so this is the tower. Um, we did a big excavation there. Um, we revealed some of the walls. Uh, it was good to have that to fall back on because we knew that there was archaeology there. It was unquestionably big stuff that people could get hands on with. And we knew it would generate finds, which it did. Nothing particularly tremendously exciting. So I, I kind of uh, bow to Richard's pictures. <laughs> uh, I can't show you any really good finds because it was scraps of pottery. Um, but it was great because the volunteers just loved it. It didn't matter. Um, they just loved the whole experience. And uh, this is a, a high resolution 3D model that we did as well, um, which I won't rotate because it will kill the computer. <laughs> And uh, as I say, finds workshops, so they, they, they got to actually engage hands-on with the heritage, whether they got to site or not, um, which was fantastic from my point of view. So what did they think? Because that's the crucial thing. Um, what I really wanted to do when I was talking to them is compare the castle project with the Bert Whistle project. I wanted to try and understand, you know, was there things that we, they'd rather that we had done by leading on the project that they would have done if they had control of it? So Joan um, is a, a figurehead of the community. She's, she's an absolutely stoic lady. Um, I, I mean, she suffered a battle with cancer a couple of years ago, and you wouldn't know it, honestly. She's genuinely an incredible person, and she's responsible for drumming up all the enthusiasm. Um, so I asked her, and she said that the castle was absolutely fantastic, that it was a great project, but as a group of volunteers, they really had no idea. They had no direction. They were just, they wanted to look at a castle. They asked for help, they got help, but they had no clear, what, as a professional archeologist, what we would call aims and objectives. They didn't have a real project design. It was just, there's something there, we want to go and look at it. Um, so they relied heavily on expert advice from the HLF, Historic England, um, professional archeologists, but also you know, other people within the community who had various professions. And they found it really hard to kind of filter that um, to actually get to, to where they wanted to be as an end goal for the project. So it did meander slightly. You know, we came in and said, yes, we can do this survey. Yes, we can do this. But we were reliant very heavily on what they wanted and they didn't know what they wanted. <laughs> so um, they did say the lack of experience really made them struggle, especially with, especially with financial management and having a massive influx of cash and knowing what to do with it was a lot of pressure. Um, so when we moved on to how she found the current project, she said it was much better, much more professional, um, less pressure. Um, I was worried that when she was talking to me that she would feel like we'd shut her out and said, this is what we want to do. And I was like, do you feel like we've consulted with you? And she was like, yeah, it's great. You know, we can sit down for a cup of tea, we can have a chat on the phone. <laughs> if we don't feel something's going quite how we wanted it to, we feel we can address it. We've got that confidence to talk to you. And that was really reassuring to hear. Um, you know, she was talking about the legacy of the project, the fact that young people are involved, the fact that um, different parts of the community are working together collaboratively. So you've got the, the schools and the young people within the community, but also you know, all these retired people, but people coming from further afield and just slotting into that as well through the promotion of the project. So you know, she was saying that you know, everything um, was fantastic, but they felt it was realistic. They felt like it was a professional project that they were a real part of, rather than just kind of, oh, we might do that next, or, or can we do this next? And that was really reassuring. Um, and she was really enthusiastic, particularly about the young people. Um, Ivan, slightly more cynical, <laughs> which I like. Um, he, is, he is an absolute cracking character. He, uh, he's worked in education his entire life. Um, he's very enthusiastic uh, about the school's aspect of the project. Now, his involvement um, with the Castle project had been limited to just coming out and doing the survey. And he said he'd enjoyed it um, and it was a great experience, but the, the current project for him was a much bigger opportunity to engage with a bigger raft of people. There was a slightly bigger budget, there was, there was more kind of infrastructure, that, which is what we brought. 
and he was he was ready to grab that with both hands. He's part of the heritage committee uh, with the captain group, and but his real concern was that the school's opportunity had been missed, um, which is really interesting because we did do quite a lot of promotion. We worked with uh, uh, an education officer to go out into the schools. The problem was that the schools didn't quite have an appetite once they realised what it entailed. So they, they liked the idea of archaeology, but they didn't want hordes of children going to site. So we approached, I think it was 15 schools across a, a, you know, that part of Lancashire, and out of those 15 schools, we only managed to get eight children in the initial batch to site. <laughs> so I can understand his frustration and his concerns. Now, the good thing is that there's another season of excavation due, and there's a, a better infrastructure in place now, and also an existing relationship. So this year, there'll be much more of that. Um, so we're listening to what he's saying, we're, we're taking it on board, and we're, we're moving forward in a positive way so that we can actually make sure that that aspect of the community is included in the project and, and they, can, they can get up on site. He did say positive things, don't worry. <laughs> if I can get them up. Uh, he loved the, the, the fact that we did all the workshops. That wasn't something that we were really able to do last time because it was a very field-based activity. Um, so he was really keen on um, the, the finance workshops, the talks that we've done. Um, we did a, 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 my colleague Rob did a, colleague, uh, did a talk in Townley Hall um, for the wider community and it was massively oversubscribed, um, which was great. And he said that everyone he talks to about it wants to do the next one. They want to, they want to be involved, they want more. Um, so that was great. There's kind of a legacy there, which smoothly comes into my next slide. I think the real legacy of the project has been, it's, it's a, a learning process all the way through. Um, we've, learned, we've learned how to um, respond to the needs of what the volunteer group want. We've learned how to kind of uh, develop workshops that suit them, their abilities, their interests. Um, so the whole project's evolving all the time. But also we're bringing diverse members of the community together, whether it's retired people who have a casual interest, or people who are in school and want to go to university to study archaeology. I just want to get hands on and understand a bit more about it. And these people are next to each other in a trench, digging and chatting away like they've been best friends for years, which is fantastic. And that was the theme throughout, is, is the, the, the inclusion of young people with um, the community and really you know, getting out there and engaging in an activity that everyone's working on. It was just fantastic. And don't ask me what that is. I've got no idea. <laughs> He's washing a stone, I think, which, you know, but it, it looks like a suitable... PR shot, so it's fine. Um, so yeah, to wrap up really, um, it's been a fantastic project to be involved in. Um, I mean, every time I go up there, because I mean, I live in Devon, so it's not a short hike, but I don't think of it as a chore. It's actually really enjoyable. Um, you go and meet these people who are completely enthused about the archeology span and heritage. And originally, the biggest change that I've seen is that they were very possessive of their heritage. Um, and now, they just want to invite people in and say, look what we've got, look what we're doing. So we've got people coming from London to work on the digs. Um, you know, we've got people coming from Scotland who just want to go on the guided tours because they're on holiday in the kind of area wider area. It's really, it's not what we expected, um, which I think is brilliant. So we're going to be doing a lot more up there um, over the next few years. Um, just kind of, even though the excavations will probably wind down, we'll be doing talks and, and all kinds of different activities for the group just to keep them involved and engaged really uh, so yeah if you want to find out anything else there are all the websites about the various different organizations and activities involved so that's me done mm -hmm.